Hello, in this video I want to have a little, well a look at as above so below um, the Pythagorean schools, the Platonic schools and essentially the uh, Hermetic philosophy and the, well the, the recent origins and so I won't be looking at uh, the very ancient origins but uh, with a focus from the 1500s to the 1600s and the reason for that is because of the documentation so we can really begin to uh, lock many things down for um, well because of the, uh, the records that have been left over and how the quadrivium especially uh, will connect through it so music, geometry, astronomy, arithmetic and how how these blend together and especially through weights and measures which is a theme that uh, is a favorite of mine and I think it's important because well literally we can weigh it and we can measure it and it, and it gives some um, something to bite on um, and because ge generally this if you mention hermeticism and all this it just gets sort of waved away and it's and it's connected with um, more very uh, a Hollywood vision, for instance, the Philosopher's Stone. People assume, you know, the the um, it's been inserted inserted into our culture that uh, alchemy is uh, and, and the Philosopher's Stone is about turning lead into gold. And well, you can cannot deny that part of it. But the interesting thing is that we actually can turn lead into gold. And there's been some recent discoveries on that. But what we really have is a system of science and encoding encoding knowledge and the birth of the modern scientific age can be 100% connected to this particular period and and I'll be looking at um, especially English history but before we begin so we have Andrea Palladio uh, he's a very famous architect and so um, at this time what we had was a, a rebirth of, of classical architecture what, what by that I mean Greco-Roman architecture but also um, Greco-Roman philosophy, for instance, the Greeks believed that you know, they made beautiful sculptures and, and they based it on what they deemed to be the perfect uh, proportions of a man, like uh, Protagoras, man is the measure of all, all things. And so, um, okay, so here's a, here's a picture of Pelagio and you can see as a comparison to um, Petra in Jordan, um, which has the same style, the Corinthian columns, and these themes and, and the, uh, all the little details is, um, essentially was reintroduced um, in the 15th of the 16th century or the 1500s by Pelagio, but it was more than just uh, copying the designs, it was also very strongly connected with the, the philo philosophy of older periods through the Corpus Hermetica and other such books. Um, Euclid, uh, writings on Plato and Pythagoras and others. We had this rebirth in a, in a particular type of philosophy, essentially based on ob observing nature and, uh, and, ancient, and ancient themes. And it's no um, coincidence that this happened just at the time when we had, uh, you know, moving out of Renaissance towards the Enlightenment and this well, an explosion of scientific knowledge, and so now we begin with Queen Elizabeth the First, and she's very important because basically during her reign, immediately before um, and immediately after, but the really chunky bit of history being at the time of uh, Queen Elizabeth the First, we have some many uh, very important things happening, not just politically, uh, but more on well the philosophical and the scientific sense of it. Now there's a bit out there, and and uh, and so the what um, the Rosicrucian connections to Queen Elizabeth, or and the, or the Hermetic connections, the Neoplatonic connections to Queen Elizabeth directly, but to the people who moved in her circle and the dominant thinkers at the time and the publications, which essentially have set up our modern world. So our weights and measures, you know, not well, if you have to include the meter in there as well because. But, um, well, for instance, we see the picture of Elizabeth with scepter and orb. This is something I've done uh, on a previous video, but it's worth repeating over. What we have there is a representation of weights and measures. So the ruler holds the ruler, you know, the, the rule or the rod and, and the orb. One being a ruler, one being uh, a measurement of weight. And now it's, always, it's been a long-standing tradition that this... 
uh, that the king or the queen or, or the monarch, the, the ruler, defines what weights and measures are. It's one of the, well, one of the first things um, in regard to it because it's so important to trade and to tax, well, collecting taxes, for instance. It's it's hugely important, um, not something to be overlooked. And so, whether we're we're weighing gold or measuring land, um, weighing grain, you know, weighing pretty much any product, measuring, very important. But it, this, of course, is a basis of civilization and goes back to the very beginning of recorded civilization. For instance, here, um, the Egyptian Book of the Dead. And so, just to, we'll go through, uh, uh, or rehash a bit. Well, I've done a video on it, but just repeat um, some of those elements if you haven't seen it. And for instance, like now in uh, the rituals, for instance, like Anubis um, weighing the heart against the feather to tell for lies, but also in the Book of the Dead, there are um, not just the spiritual aspect, but the uh, the very practical aspects of weights and 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 measure are recorded in the now. For instance, thirty-two books of um, Hermes Trismegistus, and you see forty-two being connected in here as well. But uh, the really chunky part of spell twenty one hundred and twenty-five of the Book of the Dead is in I. I've not encroached on the fields, I've not added to the pan of the scales, I've not tampered with the um, plumb, plumb line, and v these various references to being um, honest with your weights and measures, which is important um, in moral connections, so for instance, the, um, the development of a better person, so to speak, in Freemasons and such groups, and, and the, these themes of honesty and honest dealing on the level, square house, etc., very much connected with weights and measures. But also, for, so for instance, going back still in the ancient time, um, Hammurabi, and, uh, which is a, the Code of Hammurabi, a famous book of law, which, again, dealt a lot with weights and measures, how much one should pay in compensation, etc. But you also notice that the symbol he's holding is the same as of Ishtar, and this in itself is, well, it's, it's a scepter and orb, in other words. It's a, it's a symbol of standardised measures, of royal measure. Now, you'll find similar themes, for instance, this is a reconstruction, but this was a... Um, one of the earliest depictions of Zeus, which is holding the orb and a rod, and very similar. So this is a reconstruction of Athena in the Parthenon in Tennessee, which also has I've done in the previous series, Hermetic America, and there's connections there as well. But you're also going to find the same uh, symbols, and sp or speaking about the honesty of of weights and measures. So, for instance, in Leviticus, that you have. Uh, just um, balances, just weights, that you have honesty in your weights as well. And, and just a reminder, whether it's trade or whether it's taxes, uh, you know, whether it's dealing in land and, and you know, and dividing up land, etc., weights and measures, y y you can't have a civilization w without it. Um, in Proverbs, again, there's another um, reference to weights and measures in, in the Bible. And there are, well, there are more than a few, so I might have... Um, uh, might have doubled up on this one, but anyway, just as a so whether it's um, ancient Egypt, uh, Babylon, Greece, and you'll also find in very many like I remember uh, hearing a few folk tales from um, Thailand and and um, the Far East, where you have uh, similar connections. Even the first emperor of China basically standardised architectural forms as well as uh, weights and measures. It's it's really at the core of founding any civilization or empire, and this is why it's so important. So we come back to the well, um, uh, Queen Elizabeth, and you see well the French kings, but also again in this uh, the Christian tradition, the, the divine weights and proportions, and this concept of what is a what is the perfect weights and measure is very much connected to uh, well Hermeticism because it's got. Well, because there are there are practical aspects, but there are also philosophical, spiritual aspects to this as well as we will have a look into. But, um, for instance, in Sydney or in Winnipeg, uh, and well, again, connections to Virgo, and there are more than a f there are several connections in the constellations in regards to weights and measure. 
so whether it's from the gods or uh, or, or, or the divine power which emerges from um, well, what has used to be in monarchy, but again it's continued through. So one of the most important um, documents in the in the growth of uh, nation states and democracy as we know now is the Magna Carta, and that one small is. Um, very strongly connected with weights and measures. For instance, the, the nobles want to basically set standards to be made, and so that's why since the Magna Carta, the king's weights have been stored at the exchequer. So you you could go in, you could compare your weights to there. You wouldn't get taxed too much because there'd been um, some arbitrary change in weights and measures. But well, taxes, land, sides of, of roads, rent, market prices... So not just for the nobles, this was also very important for the people down uh, the chain. And grains are a standard of weights and, and measures. So um, you, you put grains in a line, for instance, three grains is one inch, but also in the measurement of not just length, but also weight. So for instance, the uh, English florin brought in by Edward III, um, 1344, we see where 108 grains, which connects basically from the Greco-Roman scale. So this, this is ancient knowledge which has been brought back up. Um, also, f under Queen Elizabeth, an important part was that she uh, defined the mile as we understand it today. So 5,280 feet or 1,760 yards. This was a Weights and Measures Act in Parliament, uh, 1593. Earlier kings, such as I think it was Henry VIII, brought in that all uh, gold and silver will be measured by the troy ounce, which is slightly different from the uh, food ounce and and all the apothecaries ounce. But um, but well, an interest well, 1760 yards. So through my previous videos, now I'm not going to go into the numbers in this one, but it's just worth reminding uh, that how often these connect to the Great Pyramid and New Jerusalem, and New Jerusalem especially because the King James Bible uh, is very important because at that point it's where New Jerusalem, the dimensions are described in furlong, as, uh, apart from the older descriptions which are in stadia. But well, 5,280 feet, 528 sacred Jewish uh, cubits is the base length of a pyramid. And so these standards, which again, especially since the Magna Carta, etc., have been put on prominent display, but this actually is a practice going back to Roman times, a golden milestone, and um, sacred temples would have sacred weights and measures so that anyone who come to do business in the market uh, would, not, would not be... Because if you got caught cheating your scale, especially in the market, you're in really big trouble. And, well, 528, so rods and miles, but also how this will convert. So, for instance, 33 pounds is 528 ounces. So, uh, this connection between weights and measures and these very important numbers uh, is something which is uh, very important. Well, hu hugely important for, for, for not just the practical elements, but we'll see also in moving towards the broader strokes of Hermeticism. And he here, for example, we see the well, New Jerusalem plus the weights and measures and the description of the earth and some beautiful arithmetic emerging from there. And even so, the, um, now we're talking you know, over... 16th to the 17th century these things were now known and published about um, and so but okay now but the important point now well this is Queen Elizabeth but you know who was the company she kept and there are to begin with three very important people Edmund Gunter, John Dee and Francis Drake now Francis Drake and and John Dee would be uh, pretty famous pretty popular but uh, Edmund Gunter is 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 the, the really really important one in there and we'll also so we'll have a look at uh, well symbol it. So for this particular um, picture of Elizabeth, you see her with the pelican at her chest, which is uh, the uh, rosy cross, rose croix, uh, Rosicrucianism, for instance. And now she also has the. Uh, rose up there. Now that might be the Tudor rose, so the, a question mark there, but I think that, that it's like a subtle double reference because we'll see later how strong these connections to Rosicrucianism, etc. Now, just as a uh, the, the picture of the Rosicrucian picture, which features the bee and the beehives, also how this is a standard symbol up to now, Masons, Odd Fellows, Theosophy, all these sorts of groups and, and just as an ex, um, example so the 18th uh, level on the Scottish right 
the Knight of the Rose Qua, Rose Cross, is uh, all very strongly uh, connected to, well, at least at the moment, Freemasons. And you'll see, for instance, on the coat of arms on the state of Louisiana, the Catholic Cathedral, St. Peter's and Paul's here in Goulburn, Australia, or, or many other places, but also the Anzac Memorial, World War One Memorial, Sydney University, again, we have this pelican symbolism, a symbolism of sacrifice, but there are also alchemical connections and alchemy, as we'll look, uh, all these people around her circle were, were uh, alchemists. Uh, but also very strong in all sorts of, you know, esoteric slash occult, Freemasons again, and that whole sphere of um, it's very important. But going back to Rosicrucianism, so that particular Mason chart is relatively modern, and the first full Mason lodges, as we understand them today, still do, did not exist yet in the time of um, Queen Elizabeth, the, the Grand United. Now there were Mason lodges, but they were more for stone masons it wasn't free and accepted masons as we know uh which is the main main group now we're still very much into the the, the guilds and the livery guilds and so a, a mason was a mason and uh, not just a member of of uh of you know in a social club sense a member now queen elizabeth edmund gunter john d and francis Drake. these are the uh now, uh, Francis Bacon will also be included, but we'll look at him later because he wasn't really in her inner court. It was after that he emerged as an important person. But um, we'll begin with Francis Drake, who was a, a pirate uh, privateer, um, an important navigator. Now, one of the famous stories is that he was playing bowls when they saw the Spanish Armada approaching, and he said, no, let's finish the game first, because he wanted to uh, draw them in even closer. And and the Spanish Armada is very important because it's a turning point in, in history. It's where, uh, well, we'll see in a moment, but basically where the Spanish Empire uh, dominance ended, and the beginning of the English Empire and the the English Navy. And this is particularly important because with the uh, the growth of the English Empire, especially uh, in the New World, uh, the USA, Canada, and Australia, that these systems of weights and measures will be transferred through. And well, again, they're not. They were actually not invented during this period, but we will see, um, yeah, but they are very important and that they were used in the design of street plans, uh, architecture uh, later on as well. But sticking with before this has happened, we have to look at Francis Drake and one of the famous things that he did was to circumnavigate the world. Now Magellan had done it uh, not too long before and Francis Drake rep uh, repeated that, but this is important because of, uh, for one thing, mapping um, and trade routes and, and all these related concepts. But, uh, well, there's quite a bit on Francis Drake and his connections to Rosicrucian uh, schools and and the, the wider context. Now, even the ones which dim, which uh, diminish it still don't deny that there there is a, there is a connection. So, but. Well, there is a Rosicrucian theme running, um, surrounding Francis Drake, and so uh, now here we see this Gunther, D, and Drake. Um, now, Francis Drake is relatively well known and and famous still now, and uh, well, so is John D, Doctor uh, John D, and he's imp well, he's also very relevant to Hermeticism as well now. He was uh, interested in Renaissance Neoplatonism, so the philosophy of of Plato and the Neoplatonics, especially. He was you know, hermeticist. There's no um, dispute about that, really. He was a geometrician, mathematician, astronomer, astrologer, and a diviner. So he was. Well, we'll have a look at that in a moment. And but already, just within these descriptions of what he's involved in, what he's, he's studying, we also well, we already have three of the uh, three of the quad quadrivium. Now, uh, um, geometry, arithmetic, and astronomy, and by definition, he would be connected to music because all of these things blend together through the very sacred numbers, which is embedded in architecture across the world. 
Now, one of his his famous uh, um, Monus Hieroglyphica by John Dee, that was essentially his symbol, his signature. And, well, if you're familiar with this, this is a, a connection of planetary symbols, also, well, Mercury to uh, begin with. And this same uh, hieroglyph was used in the chemical um, uh, wedding by Kristen Rosenkrauts. And it was also used by John uh, Winthrop Jr., who was an alchemist and who travelled to the New World. Basically, this is the key of where it was introduced into the New World, so the, uh, the English uh, settlements in North America. And John Winthrop Jr. was also studied at the Inner Temple, and that's a, well, connected to uh, Knights Templar and law, and it's one of these uh, really famous old... Uh, basically a livery guild building in London. Uh, now John Dee in his early 20s was in, um, invited to lecture on the geometry of, Luke, uh, of Euclid in Paris. So he's, a, he's into geometry, he's, no, you know, he's quite experienced, uh, knowledgeable in the field, also very famous for n navigation and these things of course will all blend together because through geometry, arithmetic and astronomy you get the, the basic fundamentals of the navigator's art and well he was also known to be uh, an, an alchemist again this is not something that's really uh, disputed it's maybe overlooked and not familiar with but essentially he was a hermeticist by practice every you know he's got he's ticking all the boxes um, here but another particularly interesting thing so John Dee and Edward Kelly were basically partners and so we have a, a couple famous pictures, one of John Dee and Edward Kelly uh, conjuring a spirit and one where John Dee is on its own because uh, John Dee was very well known. Now, even the symbols in the background, we have a cross staff and we also have uh, um, the Roman surveyor's tool as well. But uh, so he was an astrologer and a diviner and he was into conjuring spirits and this type of uh, thing. So there we see uh, uh, one of his famous pictures. Now you can see his talisman, um, which has multiple uh, uses. Now some other, now for instance, okay, here we see a comparison of his tal talisman and the seal of God by John Dee, which includes the seven-pointed star as well as the five-pointed star. Uh, the five-pointed star, it's possible to con construct with a compass and straight edge, the seven-pointed star is a ve is a bit of an an enigma. But Ed, John Dee and Edward Kelly are basically the fathers of Enochian magic, and, and again, it was a rebirth from Corpus Hermetica and uh, older uh, traditions which come through through Greece and through the Moors and through other parts. And Enochian magic was uh, Frater Akkad and Alistair Crowley, for instance, uh, rebirthed it once more in their own peculiar. Uh, way. By that I mean that Alistair Crowley and Charles uh, Stansfield Jones were not matricians, geometricians and all these things which uh, John Dee uh, and Edmund Gunter and uh, to an extent Francis Drake uh, were. But John Dee was a court astrologer and advisor to Queen Elizabeth I and hopefully I won't get plinged for copyright but here's a clip from the movie Elizabeth uh, starring Kate, Kate Blanchett. Mars is due to take the ascendant three days after the anniversary of your majesty's birth and also on that day there is a full moon which governs the fortune of all princes of the female gender. Princes of the female gender. I mean to say a prince who is also a woman. Yes, Dr. D, I I am following you. What does it mean? It means the rise of a great empire, Majesty, the fall of another. Convulsions. Which empire is to rise and which is to fall? That I cannot say, Majesty. Astrology is as yet. So John Dee had some influence in the court of Queen Elizabeth I. But now I'm going to do a detour and we have a look at the London Stone, which is a, a bit of a mystery and it's being carried on. And there's more than a few suggestions about connections to John Dee, not that John Dee created the London Stone, but that w w was important to him. And why it's important is, well, for instance, the Golden Milestone in Rome, the point from which all 
uh, Roman roads have have, uh, have been measured or are measured from. So it's like a, a zero point. And we have similar themes, so both in the Roman, but uh, the Greek world, the concept of the Hermstone, as in Hermes, and that this is to mark out sacred precincts. Well, there's a dispute on exactly how, how, how old the London stone is, but going back to Roman times, this concept, and earlier than Roman times, is, is the concept of what we, we sent, you might call it a magical stone, the point from which all things are measured, and survey, town planning, uh, even military camps, so forth. Again, hugely important in the Roman times. So survey, uh, again, which which connects to navigation and all these other points. But so John Dee, undeniably Hermetic. Francis Drake, strong connections with uh, Rosicrucian. But now the lesser known of these figures, and probably the more important in the wider scale, in my belief, is Edmund Gunther. Uh, just like um, John Dee is a Polymath, so he's an astronomer, mathematician, geometer, uh, also a clergyman. Now, he, I will say, introduced the Gunther's chain or the Surveyor's chain, which is 66 feet long or 100 links. Now, we already showed, so the foot and the yard uh, weights and measures are pretty much, uh, as we know them now, were pretty much locked, you know, written in stone, so to speak, in the time of Elizabeth. And he, he was commissioned... Um, under Queen Elizabeth I to create the chain. Now, why? Now, well, again, measuring roads, measuring land, which in its would measure taxes and, and all these things which are connected to it, uh, crucial business in running the country or, or, or an empire as well. But with so many of these things, uh, the Hermeticist is about encoding levels. So on a more pr practical tools have a much deeper meaning. Now, another important uh, invention um, or least publication of by Edmund Gunther because the chain predates Gunther and I'll look at that in maybe future videos uh, it's by thousands of years. So he invented a slide rule and so he was doing some um, uh, well some important maths at the time. Now another one of his inventions was this, the, the quadrant and so again with a simple plumb line very much well, pretty much it's an early version of the sextant and he was. This was a navigator's tool, so you could calculate the hour, and then by knowing which hour it was where you were at, you could then calculate um, uh, longitude and latitude, which was not really solved until a bit later. Now, uh, his writings include uh, work on trigonometry, but work on the cross staff as well. So he, he wrote quite a bit. Uh, very well, hugely, hugely important but to many fields so well maths land survey construction um, and as we'll, we shall see because another one of the well so-called inventions we just he wrote on it and uh, defined certain things regarding the cross staff which was a very important siding tool for for astronomy and we'll see land survey uh, navigation cartography so the sailors making maps using tools such as this they could draw the map as they sailed along and so here's some of the, the basic tools used at that time but and we have to remember at this particular point they did some awesome um, measurements some awesome science now we've improved on it but the, 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 you know, they were working at a very high level of precision with some very basic tools. And so the quadrant, the chain, the cross staff, and also the Gunther's chain, we see navigation being um, a, key, a key theme. So, and at the same time, at, um, we have uh, Sir Francis Drake circumnavigating, um, circumnavigations of the globe, sorry, the typo there. And, but also the growth of... Well, we already had the Spanish, Dutch, Portuguese empires, uh, but now we really have the growth in the New World, so um, especially in North America. Now, the cross staff, why, it is, why is it so important? Well, it works together with the quadrant and the chain, but, um, well, for instance, and there's a few other little uh, knickknacks that are really worth mentioning, and that is that... Uh, it's mentioned in his book on the cross staff. He he describes the length of it, and it's exactly one yard, uh, which is three feet, thirty six inches, or one hundred and eight grains, or forty eight fingers, which is in itself an important uh, connections to this whole hermetic theme. in regards to the weights and measures of architecture, both 
brand spanking new as well as the classical period. So, but what else? There's, there's quite a bit in regards to this cross stuff. So we see his um, the second book and well his uh, trigonometry. So he's able to work out angles and then lengths and and these type of things, which is very important because again his invention the chain which was used to to measure land but uh well it was an important tool of defining even for the cart for the map makers as they were sailing but see in, in we can see in that diagram so the f one of the, the first figure he's measuring the height of of towers so that's one of the aspects of it now once you've worked out the height of your tower you can now measure land using the chain and so we see the uh, the two figures there in the center and we can even see the, the lines drawn, so they're measuring land and they're using that because they have a reference point, the tower, they know the height of the tower and then they can, watch the, as the angle changes, they're able to, to do geodesic measurements, earth-based measurements as well. We'll, uh, we'll get to geodesic because it, geometry, earth, geometry, earth, metry measure, geometry, earth measure. But the cross staff is also important for astronomical measurements. You might notice that he is looking, he's sighting the moon and the star, which is a connection to the sidereal month, 27.3 days. Um, during Gunther's time, now he's not accredited with the discovery, but he did notice that, that the, the compass needle is basically moving, so he understood he was studying magnetism as well and, and the, well, the sh basically the shifting of, uh, of true north as opposed to magnetic north. Uh, and again with the quadrant, he's, he's studying time because we're, we're calculating the hour and then from the hour we're trying to work out longitude and latitude. So this is before the marine chronometer. Now also, so at that time we have the cross staff, but we're also using Gunter's scale, so this early version of a slide rule to also do certain calculations and to make these calculations easier. A marine chronometer, uh, basically a clock, we were able to work out longitude and latitude, no problems, but up to then uh, longitude had always been a problem, how far east or west. How far north and south you are is pretty easy to calculate, how far east or west is more of a difficult thing. But in Gunther's time, we see the, el the basic elements, all the tools were there and people were, were literally sailing around and making uh, very accurate maps uh, and, and and the development of that. It was just more complicated with the marine chron chronometer, it became easier. Now, also on that first page of the second book, um, he also sp specifies uh, a circle is defined by 360 degrees, each degree made up of 60 minutes and each minute made up of 60 seconds. When did the 360 degree compass divide it like this? Well, uh, arguments will go either way but I'm using this particular period in history because what we do is we have a whole bunch of things that are locked down. This is the, the, the modern scientific period entirely, the, the, all the core elements are here and they're at this particular time in history and so important again because we're going to see the transfer of this information through the dominance of the English Empire. Um, but also going back a few centuries earlier than that because we had already brought in the florin of 108 grains and there we can in the lower left corner we see the uh, Greco-Roman scales and how they convert to uh, English grain so uh, 108 uh, 54, 72, 144, 432. These are all the harmonic numbers, the beautiful numbers, the ones which I just, you know, go on infinite, ad infinitum in regards to architecture, both modern and going back to the ancient period. Um, also worth noting that the 360 degrees compass is 21,600 minutes. That's exactly the number of nautical miles because that's the definition of a nautical mile is one minute. Of 360 degrees around the globe and the Roman uh, which become the Italian mile is well it is a nautical mile um, so again just a history in regards to these things is is, is pretty piss poor I must say because it's it's you know it's down there in the records I'm not making these things up you can you know use these as keywords you'll find it back now Macedonian or, or Byzantine we're also using this 108 it's just a really important in weights and measure and that it carried through again because this period was born out of uh, well the Renaissance especially when Greco-Roman architecture and forms and philosophy was um, becoming reborn in um, in Europe especially 
and so okay the Gunter's chain um, well w whether it's in in Canada or Australia or America the this was used as a this one of the standards for instance 66 feet wide roads again across Australia and America and Canada and this is like an important reference because it shows the uh, how v this was passed on and through um, from Queen Elizabeth into Gunter and how it's uh, been so important because we we see uh, these countries which are still economically um, politically uh, dominant around the world and how this well it could color in a whole bunch of other countries as well but just as an example hugely hugely important the impact of Edmund Gunter okay so I'm gonna have to split this video in two uh, maybe a few other pieces because there's quite a bit yet to go but just as a uh, review um, already so in the 1500s or the 16th century we already have this uh, rebirth of uh, classical Greco-Roman type philosophy and architecture as we can see um, from uh, Palladio and this is happening uh, across Europe because in especially in the Renaissance what we had was a lot of people going to Greece, Rome, uh, Egypt, uh, the, the Middle East, uh, India and studying, measuring temples and bringing information back. So it wasn't just about trade goods, it was also a trade of knowledge and information and it was like a perfect storm of events in Europe to see it really blossom and especially around the period of Queen Elizabeth I. Now there are a few other interesting characters, uh, Albrecht Dürer, a uh, little bit art, not shortly after Isaac Newton, but Francis Drake. So. Ferdinand Magellan was the first to, uh, at least in recorded history, to circumnavigate the Earth and Francis Drake was second and it's so important to the growth of the English Empire and, you know, uh, and, and well, trade but also the, the movement of knowledge. When people move they'll, they'll trade goods and they'll trade information and one of well, um, Edmund Gunther's very important connections to Francis Drake because of navigation and also John Dee being very interested in, in this same field because it connects to geometry, it connects to arithmetic and it connects to astronomy. You can't do any of these things separately without bumping on the other one and also the, the clock and the compass and by the qu quadrant which was used to measure time and then we, by measuring time you could measure how far east and west you were of a certain point because of the time differentials and and these and with a Gunther scale you could calculate these types of things you could also uh, by using sighting tools like the cross staff you could all at angles we would measure how, you know the coastline by chains which is why Australia Canada America why 66 feet is so important it's essentially a standard um, for for land for for blocks and for street widths road it's all it's all in there and what weights and measures and so once the imperial units we we the basically the international standard of imperial units comes from this uh from the english and especially during this period in time because foots uh and weights were, were shifting but basically they've been locked in from the period of queen elizabeth and that's very much in the, um thanks to people like Edmund Gunther and to well to a lesser extent John Dee but especially Edmund Gunther in the chain but for instance one mile 5,280 feet connections to New Jerusalem and so many others now someone I haven't mentioned and I'll bring up in future episodes is uh, Francis Bacon because especially in connection to the King James Bible and the description of the holy city New Jerusalem and how it changes from stadia to furlong and at this point in time John Dee, Edmund Gunther etc uh, the furlong is a furlong as we know it now it's you only really hear about it in horse racing is but uh, one furlong is 10 chain 10 Gunther's chain is one furlong and just a review so we had a one of uh, John Dee's quotes and here's another one um, so explaining again his uh, his symbol the um, minus hieroglyphica and how it's a representation of the earth the sun and the moon as well as the planets in their respective paths and it's 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 essentially it's an amalgam of multiple astronomical planetary symbols but uh, Hermes or the, the Mercury symbol being one amongst them so pretty much the end of uh, this video uh, always 
think I'm going to start small, but you, it, it's even being very brief, it's quite a, 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 a large topic and there's a lot of information in regards to what published information, um, not um, sourced from, from blogs or, or hearsay or that type of stuff. So even if you just use this visa's keywords and follow it through, um, even for instance with John D and, uh, and Gunther, Wikipedia is a great place to start, but go down to their sources and then go a little bit deeper. But uh, just for the surface level, or even you know, to have a look there. But anyway, with that, hope you enjoyed this. Uh, there'll be more to come, and have a good one.